Yeah, I mean, I think um, also right now, in the narrow context of tanks, which is where we came in, we're the what, 50th, 60th biggest operator of tanks on the planet. Nobody cares. Mm. If we go to it, it went out to industry and said, come on, boys, design us a tank, nobody cares. And I think, I mean, the, the MOD, and again, the Army, particularly for various reasons, has been terrible at partnering with industry. It's easier on the larger multinational air problems that can get done at multinational level. We have, the MOD has been terrible at, at it. And, you know, it, many companies will not, will not deal with the Ministry of Defence because the, the hoops are so expensive to get through and then it gets cancelled anyway. I think there is an opportunity for someone if they were brave, which is, um, you know, we can argue the merits of M M one A three and Leopard two A seven and Challenger two or Challenger three, they've all largely got the sa a similar problem, which is they've got to about the biggest weight that it's sensible to be. The battlefield hasn't got any safer, so stripping off armour isn't really an option. Active armour might help a bit, um, but not hugely. It's quite heavy stuff. Um, and no one quite knows where to go. The Russians have gone out on Bruce's beloved Armata or whatever, and that's one way to go. And there might just be a way for a private guy to come along and say, well, how about this? But no one's going to take that risk if the only customer in town is the MOD, which yeah, means probably, yeah. which means probably the army in the context of tanks has got three decisions to make. One, we are expeditionary, therefore, do we want to be able to go expeditionary at full strength or do we have to tell the politicians, forget about it? We cannot, we're not prepared, we're not able, and we're not equipped to do that on the budget. Um, if they decide actually the politicians might say that's not the right answer, try again, then they've got to do something about Challenger. Um, that said, Challenger is more obsolescent than it is obsolete. I don't know many people who would rather be sitting in a T the T90 end, end of the range or a Challenger end of the range if you went one on one or even one on two. Um, and, and the third thing is that having decided what its future is, it needs to get some sensible thought and discussion going about what the modern high intensity state on state battlefield might look like and start designing the weapon of the future rather than the weapon of last year. Well, thank you, Paddy. I think we're, we're talking about multinationality now. Um, so that leads to uh, an option that is implicit in, in what we're talking about, but is, but is explicit in the rate reading from uh, RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute, where um, it makes it makes explicit what apparently some people are talking about that the British Army might specialize in areas other than ground maneuver warfare. So the army might so the MOD might be thinking that the army should specialize in cyber and uh, light expeditionary um, light expeditionary operations um, within NATO and other states, principally Germany would specialize in heavy armor or provide the heavy armor to a multinational package. Now, does anybody have any, any in, insight into whether that's really what the MOD is thinking? Or do you want to comment on the viability of going that way? Anybody? Well, uh, they're, they're very much thinking along those lines. And the idea of having small, highly mobile forces based in things like jackal or, or, or small um, armored vehicles that can be easily air transported is, is one way to do it. However, um, and um, as James our allies expect us to, and I think the Americans would not take us seriously if we did not have uh, a serious heavy armor capability because we, we, you know, we just couldn't take part force they contributed a, a much more um, uh, medium or, or light force and literally they were told you, know, you go and stand over there and we'll carry on because they just weren't equipped 
to carry the fight to the enemy. So it, it would be a real loss in capability um, if, if, we, if we did not have, it, have heavy armor. So, and I think that's a, you know, a worry from the allied point of view and, 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 and how, how we're regarded um, as a partner. And you know, but if we can't be relied upon, then we will become irrelevant. And if we want to have more influence, um, just providing, you know, special forces or electronic, I, I think our credibility will be shot. Yeah, Nicholas, let me, sorry, let, let me ask Nicholas just to clarify what you're saying, I think, is your, your advice to the MOD, right? So, so, so it's clear you would advise the MOD not to over-specialize by getting rid of heavy armor. But, um, but do you have any insight into how seriously yes, MOD agrees with you? Um, I, we, we don't know exactly what they're thinking yet. I mean, they haven't really, we'll know, you know very soon when the, the findings of the review are published probably uh, in November. But the, the Navy and, uh, and Air Force have released their sort of plans, but the Army hasn't done so yet. So we're waiting for and that will give some clarity to, to where um, the, the, the trust of the strategy is going to be. But I, I think the message has got through that we have to retain some form of heavy armor capability. But maybe, just maybe, we can be innovative about how we do that in terms of the vehicle choices that we make. And I think one aspiration, something I've been involved in directly, is with the strike brigade creation and the adoption of the boxer vehicle. And that is a very, uh, a very good capability. It can do a lot of different things well. High, medium and low intensity warfare. And remember, you know, the British boxer will be 38 and a half tons, has a lot of armor on it. In fact, it's better protected than the warrior will be once it's upgraded. So you put a cannon on that, rather like the French have done with the BBCI, and you've got um, an infantry fighting vehicle that can go anywhere and do anything, because you can't use that alone, you need a tank as well. And you can't put a 60-ton tank on a wheel platform. But that mix of wheels and tracks, it's clever, can achieve a lot of things for a lot less money. So that's, that's the thinking. Yeah, so thank you. So that's going to be the next item. We, we need to discuss options of wheeled vehicles as alternatives or, or as supplements to tracked main battle tanks. But I think I cut off Paddy on the last item. Paddy, what did you, what did you have? Um, I can't remember. Sorry. <laughs> so, so if, if I may. I, I can remember. Yeah, we'll get so, going, sorry, please. So, sorry, I can't. The, In terms of countries who've actually gone to war with tanks, we're one of them. America's another, French a bit. This is in the past 30 years. The Germans haven't, because they have constitutional problems whenever you need them to turn up. The Dutch haven't. So if you say, well, who else is going to, who's going to take over the alleged great British um, heavy armor capability? Uh, it might be news to some people that we're, we're looking to do that. I think what more widely on the point, post Brexit, we're still on the Security Council. If we can't go off and play on our own account in a, in a, sensible, in a sensible war, the whole Security Council goes down the road. And then you get into the nuclear weapons thing and that's, that's beyond the scope of this. But the, the political decision that's being fudged and fuffed is, are we going to be a Premier League army or not? End of. If we are, then we're doing heavy armour. If we're doing heavy armour, right, now can, how can we do clever heavy armour and what clever things and wise things can we do with the equipment set that is coming online and the options for box are very interesting. Yeah. And Bruce, you. you made a very interesting point earlier about the self-fulfilling prophecy where we, we just don't upgrade the vehicle at all. Then it becomes so old fashioned and obsolete that it's just easier to, to get rid of it and start again. Because then you, it's just so expensive to do that um, when you leave it so long, but you just can't afford to do it. So, you know, we kind of painted ourselves into a corner. Yeah, so let's talk about these these options. So, so Boxer is the um, most British option for a wheeled. I, I think of it as a near tank. So it's a it's a vehicle that can offer 
the lethality or close to the lethality of a main battle tank. And it certainly got better on road mobility, not the off road mobility and not the survivability, but it certainly gives you um, an option for more rapid deployment. Uh, so it supplements the main battle tank. Let's, let's, it, it, to be more exact, it mitigates one of the problems with main battle tanks is that they're slow and expensive to deploy. Um, so can we talk about how viable, what I think of as wheeled near tanks, um, how viable they are to replace some or all of the Challenger 2s? Well, it's a very simple answer. They're not. End of. Uh, and, the re and the reason is simple. The whole point about a tank is that it can duel with another tank, which means it can take a hit. Challenger 2 hull, I believe, has never been penetrated. Certainly, the Starrant never has. If you turn up with anything less than a meter plus of RHA equivalent to a tank gunfight, you will die. If you turn up with compromised mobility because you don't have the track, so you can't get yourself to the best bit of ground, you'll just die a bit sooner. Um, you know, we've simulated this a gazillion times. I um, mean, direct, direct, direct fire simulations. You, you're either a tank or you're not. The, 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 you know, the, the 30 tons extra that a challenger weighs over a boxer, 10 tons of that is armament, the other 20 tons is effectively protection. That, and, and that's it. The, the, you may have a role for a, um, a wheeled infantry fighting vehicle, which I think is what Nicholas is stating, and, and that makes sense. You know, back in the day, the Russians had two BTR battalions for every BMP battalion, because they needed to be mobile, but they didn't need to assault. They were there to exploit, having done the hard work. And, and unless you can carry the protection, and you can't against a tank round, against a fin round, you can bolt on protection against um, ATGW, you can't bolt on protection against the fin round. Um, and that's what will kill you every time. Yeah, can I can I jump in there? So you know, I, I absolutely get what you say, Patrick. About you know, uh, you, only a tank can do what a tank does. But if a tank doesn't turn up in time to influence the outcome of a battle, it's um, it's it's money wasted. And that's really what led um, Italy and Japan to develop their uh, wheel mobile gun systems, the, the Type 16 for Japan and the Centauro for Italy. And those vehicles have been highly effective. And um, you know, with the exercises that Japan has conducted with the Type 16, it realizes that the utility is so great, it's actually reduced the number of Type 10s that it's uh, purchasing. So there's certainly um, utility in the wheeled uh, mobile gun system concept. And I, I would very much like to see the UK have something like that. So not to replace, but to complement the main battle tank. And as Patrick says, if you, if you don't have a meter uh, of really solid steel in front of you, then uh, you, you're going to be toast. Sorry, might be on mute. Yeah, please. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I agree. They're not, they're clearly not a one for one replacement. Um, there nonetheless is, you know, a role that they can play in, in within a, a balanced force mix, um, offsetting some of the strengths and limitations of, of other platforms. Um, the, the question, of course, then becomes to what extent the UK does want to invest in things like active protection systems, um, you know, things like explosive reactive armor, all, the, all these other things that you can bolt on to a tank or different vehicles. The thing is all of those obviously have, have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, you know, a, an active protection system works in some circumstances, but soft kill, hard kill, not so great in other circumstances. Also not, depending on, depending on the, the mode employed, it may not be so great for the, any infantry that are standing next to the vehicle when the round comes in. Um, they're also, you know, a fairly binary thing. They're working or they're not working. You know, you, you can obviously damage these things. Uh, you, can, you can also, you know, j um, dazzle them and, and so on. Um, so they're not, they're not perfect. They're not, you know, a kind of a solution that, that renders these vehicles imper impervious in the way that some in, in the media sometimes seem to think. Um, similarly, if you start bolting on lots of other things uh, to, a, to a boxer or, or other vehicle, you start to negate the point of it in the first place, which of course is, is its mobility, its relative lightness, 
Um, and, and if it starts to look more and more and more like a tank because you've vaulted so many things onto it, then clearly you might as well have just put a tank in there in the first place. Um, so, so there is something to be said clearly for just having impressive levels of base armor, which give you passive protection at all times that, you know, they're not on or off, they're just constantly working in a way that a tank's armor, a tank's armor does. Um, I mean, the, the key point, you know, as, as Nicholas raised there, is of course the tank needs to be in the right place at the right time. Um, so it's making sure that we do have all those wider enablers to get it to to the front in the first place, the logistics tail to support it, and then clearly the information uh, superiority and decision superiority that Patrick was talking about earlier, so that we then know what we're going to use that tank for. And all those things are important for all armed forces, um, but they're going to be especially important for us if we're going to have such a small kind of critical mass of numbers of tanks. We're going to have to really make sure we get the most out of them. Same for any wheeled vehicles. We're still not going to be, you know, deploying them at the scale that some of the other partner nations are, and certainly not the scale that some of our adversaries are. So, you know, we we have to have kind of qualitative overmatch because we're not going to have quantitative overmatch. Um, and, you know, that takes a lot of investment, um, a lot of training, a lot of exercising, a lot of experimentation. Um, and, it, you know, that, that, that all costs money, and it's not clear that that's necessarily there yet. Um, I mean, I think the, the one other thing I would throw into the mix, and, and this again is certainly in no way a one-for-one a -one replacement for tanks or indeed for wheeled vehicles, um, but something that, that other countries are starting to think about is whether you start to bring in elements of human machine teaming. So you start to bring in, you know, a kind of mothership vehicle that then has a, a couple of unmanned, smaller, cheaper, more disposable vehicles trundling along it. Maybe, you know, maybe one of them with a, you know, a javelin missile on it or something like that, um, that, that substitutes, substitutes for some of the capability and starts to take it off the platform and put it around the platform instead as more of a system of systems. So there's all sorts of kind of choices that are coming up at the moment. The, the, thing, the, the challenge is, is with that complexity, we need to make sure we start, don't start repeating the same mistakes of the past, which is that we go for programs that are too ambitious, they never get funded properly, they never deliver, or, or, um, or we, you know, we go for a particular kind of bespoke solution that then doesn't have any commonality with what other countries are doing. It's expensive to maintain and sustain. And we're back in the same kind of place we, we were talking about with, with not having an MBT industry. Um, so it's, really, it's a really tricky decision to make, how you balance that. Um, and, and each individual platform um, has, to, has to fit together in, a, um, in that wider force mix. So it's, it's all for naught. And I think, I think I, I, in almost beggar's belief, but the, 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 the British concept of a strike brigade with Ajax tracked, therefore using a lot of fuel, breaking a lot because it vibrates a lot with a 40 millimeter gun and nothing more. We've already built in that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, I mean, anyone would, 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 I think, set the premise, hey, we're moving a brigade of wheeled infantry around. Can we have some firepower on wheels, please? And we absolutely swear blind that if we see what looks like a big pile of tanks, we'll go somewhere else or dig, dig very deep hole and play phone a friend or whatever. But can we have our firepower on wheels, please? It makes absolutely no sense. Um, it, 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 guarantees, it guarantees that the boxes all go hurtling down the road because I get bored of waiting for the Ajaxes, which can't go as fast and have to divert off other things so it's not to trash up the supply routes or whatever, and we'll get themselves into a bunch of trouble and tanks, turn, oh, tanks the Ajax, all six of them, um, will turn up late. I mean, if you want to be controversial, uh, what the bloody hell is the point of having four Ajax regiments? Why on earth are we buying four regiments of an armoured reconnaissance vehicle? Yeah. Absolutely right. You can't mix wheels and, and tracks in the same formation when they have to keep up with each other. Because yeah. you could mix main battle tanks with, with Boxer, but then the Boxer would be following the tanks, not the other way around. Yeah. And that would be for a deliberate attack, and you wouldn't do that until the tanks were um, moved up and in position. But I think the case for uh, putting a 40mm cannon on Boxer is very compelling. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, did, did, I, I think there's probably an equally good case for putting a larger calibre, um, but, but, but with a lower velocity, and saying, OK, we're not going tank killing, because if we get into a direct fire battle, well, a tank will die. But what yeah. we are doing is doing the suppression job that would have been done by the intimate support tanks if we had intimate support tanks and the stab gun that we had. I, don't, I, don't, I, I, I think the 40 millimetre genius to thing, though it is, is not an official foul.
and I think I think Nicol Nicholas, you, um, I mean, when you talk about the box of family, there is a concept you've written about. One of the concept their conceptual variants would have a one twenty millimeter L forty four, which is, um, you know, it's not as it doesn't have the capacity of the Challenger two, but it's you know it's a near it's it's a decent tank gun on a wheeled vehicle, so you know it's certainly more viable in lethality than than Ajax. So, so you know, so um, there are some options there. What KMW has done is they put uh, the John Cockrell Defence 105 millimeter gun turret, uh, 3000 series turret, on Boxer, and that, and that works fine within the weight limit of Boxer. But if you want to develop a proper mobile gun system that has a decent amount of protection, then you have to use that basic platform and re-engineer it. And that's what I've been trying to encourage. And, and for that to happen, it's a multinational program. And what you do is you put the engine in the back, rather like we did with the um, Saracen and, um, and Saladin back in the 60s. So two very different vehicles, but based on the same architecture. Um, and then you'd have much more armor across the frontal arc and you'd be because it would be lower and lighter you'd be able to mount a much heavier more protected turret on top and you could feasibly uh, get the 120 millimeter so you could definitely take out tanks but although you couldn't um, you couldn't receive hits in the way that you could with a main battle tank so you'd be reliant on a first round kill because if the one coming back at you is going to take you out yeah, you might, you might, you, you might also have a problem firing on the move, um, just because of the platform rock and the weak off forces. I mean, I, mean I, I, I love the engineering challenge of putting big guns on, on wheeled vehicles and making it as mobile as possible and this, that, and the other. But I always think, well, if if your doctrine is we're not sending a wheeled brigade to deal with a predominantly armoured threat, because that would be a rerun of the Charge of the Light Brigade. Um, um, you need to think, well, what's the point of the gun? Are we there to provide direct fast support to assaulting infantry? And maybe take a shot at some th second, third generation tank, in which case, in which case you're back to almost the Bradley turret, the gun missile combination makes perfect sense. We so spend most of our time hosing down the forward edge of the enemy position until we can get our dismounts into it. And if anything a bit meaty and tasty pops up that you know looks like it's got some more on it, we'll, we'll, we'll lob lots of heat at it. Um, it may or may not penetrate, or may or may not kill it, but it will certainly distract them for the crucial moment that we are, whether we're a wheeled box or pretended to be a mechanized infantry fighting vehicle or, or a wire flat, crucial moment until we delivered our design purpose and delivered our section of tough infantrymen and their bayonets into the front of the enemy position where they can get about slaying and match his enemies. We have to be cognizant of, of what the strike doctrine is about. And the, the theory says, you know, it goes back to the Cold War. We, we, if we try and defeat the Russians, for example, um, defeat their mass with our lack of numbers, we will become unstuck very quickly. And therefore, what we do with strike, it, we don't try and take the um, enemy head on. We get into a position where we find them and we fix them. And we use Boxer or Ajax, whatever we have. Uh, and then once we've, we've done that, we rely on artillery, missile systems, and anti-tank guided missiles to... And it's a stock, maybe, but it, um, I won't give you that answer until we've actually combat. I think we have to do something different because we simply don't have the mass even with tanks, to take on a very large Russian force. Actually, and to do that, of course, we're going to need artillery, and that's what we're not investing in at the moment. Yeah. If we buy all the vehicles, we will. Yeah. So, so the next item is actually going to be fires, so whether we can, um, whether we can mitigate some of the tanks' problems by replacing it with fires, which is one of the arguments that's come out of particularly Russia's use of indirect fire um, against Ukrainian heavy army, but, but but before we get there, can can I push you on force structure? Because if uh, some of you are saying um, 
I think you're saying, you think you're agreeing that there could be room for putting some wheeled heavy armor into the British Army to, to provide this quick, lower logistical burden requirement. Um, in which case, how is that going to affect force structure? I mean, are you going to add these wheeled units to the existing force structure? So you're going to have a, like a light, a, what, what would you call it, a medium weight armoured brigade in addition to the current heavy armoured brigade? Because I think, or, or do you replace main battle tank units? I think we're, if I'm right, we can only field three tank units at the moment, if I'm right. Correct. So, so if you, are you going to replace those in the new force structure, in this um, imagined force structure? Are you going to supplement it? I mean, it, what, what would the force structure look like? Anybody? Um, well, well, Nicholas and I only just agreed to this concept after much debating, so I think uh, designing a whole force structure package is, is a bit... I don't, I don't think heavy wheeled is the right term. I think it's a medium wheeled thing, as heavy as panzers, and then... I mean, the chief of the defense staff thinks Ajax is a tank because it's got a turret on it and he's an infantryman, but you know, there we go. Um, uh, you, could do, you, you could do a number of things. You could say, well, do you know what, we'll buy twice the kit, but we'll have the same sort of, the same numbers, so congratulations, you know, first tank regiment. You've got two war scenarios. One is it's a cold, miserable war against the Russians take the challenge or whatever we haven't yet bought for replacement or go and get a suntan and as a hell take the wheelie job quite a lot of the tactics quite a lot of the skills are the same and it, it is one of the bewildering things of a professional army infantrymen pretend that now they become armored infantrymen they have to retrain to go and become dismounted tank people pretend that the moment they got into a tank or whatever they forgot everything they knew last year about reconnaissance and how to um how to do stuff so so you know the um, the army could help itself I mean, for sure, if you're going to go off to war, you, you would have one set of just infantry equipped with boxers. And I suspect the logistic load on that and the structure of a, a less maintenance heavy battalion or brigade is such that it would make no sense to say, well, and when you're not doing that, you could also do it with Warwick because it would be too much of an increment. Um, but there's no reason particularly why you couldn't switch it. I mean, we currently have three regiments of light cavalry that are equipped with jack or a 40 millimeter grenade launcher and it might be they say well actually boys you know um we're just gonna give you some of these as well and those are the guys currently going for sale so um um in terms of full structure you know we haven't quite nailed the capability in the hour or so that we've been going um um but it wouldn't be as a replacement, but you could get creative, I think. You, I, I think the British Army could be far more creative about full structure, particularly in its combat elements than it currently is. So what I'd like to see for the full structure is two strike brigades with a square formation. So each one would have uh, two cavalry regiments, one with a turreted boxer and the other with a, a, a mobile gun system with the 105 gun, and then two infantry battalions. So that, that single brigade structure would be very meaty. And I would complement that with one heavy armor brigade with two tank regiments and um, two reconnaissance regiments and four infantry battalions, prob probably in tracks. And that would give you three brigades in total. And you would need a further three brigades for the overall force. And that would be one, would be 16 airborne so it's air, uh, air assault brigade, 16 air assault brigade, plus two other infantry brigades that would be more mobile. So I'm going to have to, I mean, I'm just going to have to interject in four structures. Why do we bother with paratroopers? They try and die before they get into battle. <laughs> uh, we, we drop, when did we last drop them? Suez and that ended badly. It's, it, 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 it's a myth. And, and if we're talking about dropping a capability, I guess it's a cheap capability. If you're talking to Opera about capability, when do we actually think we're ever going to parachute it, in an it, infantry? Yeah, it's, it's not a parachute capability, it's, it's an air transportable capability. Yeah. So flying a force, uh, you know, using C-130 and A4, A400M to a location to get them in theatre quickly. So an early entry force, I, I, don't, yeah. I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, and, and then the, uh, there's, there's tactical mobility in helicopters, as, as was useful in Kosovo, uh, for instance, right? Okay, James, do you have anything on the force structure? 
Well, I mean, I think Patrick and Nicholas should probably trademark this, um, this yeah, idea yeah. they've come up yeah. with before someone tries to, to steal it and sell it. Um, no, I mean, nothing huge to add. I mean, just to, to kind of, I think, double down on the point Patrick was making about um, flexibility, which is, um, you know, it, clearly there's a cost incentive to have that flexibility, but um, it's also just about having, you know, freedom of freedom of action. It's about being able to respond to contingencies. And it actually means we can be a bit less predictable to our adversaries as well, which um, you know clearly, clearly is always going to be useful. So there's, there's certainly merit in that. Um, it's also you know enables you to start retain, developing, and then retaining a kernel of skills and a, a wide variety of different missions, a wide variety of different platforms. And that then means in future, if if you know the, the fiscal situation changes and we decide, heaven forbid, that we actually want to increase the size of the overall force, you can then grow that from a from you know from a base of of kind of. Uh, Super qualified personnel and so on. So there's certainly merit in that, but no, I think nothing more to, be, to add beyond that. Well, thank you. I think so. Um, just Paddy, yeah, go ahead, please. If I just amplify James's last point, I, uh, I'm going to it, it, at, at some level, if you lose tanks, you'll never get them back. Hmm. The, I mean, we're probably on the cusp of losing the institutional memory of how to use these things and how to make it happen. The moment you lose it, it would take you decades to get them back and they'll be very expensive decades because you'll do it every wrong way before you even get close to doing it right. Yeah, we, I mean, we do a lot of work for, for MODs, for NATO and others on kind of skills retention at RAND and, and it's, we always talk about the, the kind of bathtub curve uh, and it's very easy to slide down the side of that bathtub but if you're the spider, it's really hard to get out the other side. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's going to take you five, 10, 15, 20 years to, to build up the people who are the kind of gray beards. You know, it's, it's, it, it's relatively easy to stick someone in a tank, tell them how to drive it, read some doctrine to them, and then kind of point them in a direction of a, you know, a hill you want them to take or whatever. It's far, far harder to retain that kind of implicit knowledge from the people who've done, you know, they've been there, done that, they've, they've deployed multiple times, and they've seen all the things, the kind of the corners you can cut, uh, the corners you shouldn't cut, you know, they, they know when the machine is going to keep working beyond the design tolerances set up by the manufacturer. They know when it's not. Um, and all of that stuff, you know, you, you can only you can only get by living and breathing it and then passing it down kind of generation to generation um, within within the armed forces. It's not something you can just get from a, you know, from a, a training manual and, and a few years of, of uh, activity hastily trying to rebuild rebuild that skill and and in the world we're talking about you know we're talking about a world where threats are more numerous more complex and they're emerging more quickly so the idea that we would have the strategic warning that oh by the way there's probably going to be a conflict in five or eight years time that we could then rebuild those skills and capabilities just isn't the world we're in anymore we're in a world where you know you're going to need this in a month a week six months at most so the idea that you can reconstitute masts at speed just is just is you know a fallacy um so it's got to be there you've got to have you know critical mass of people and i think that that's something that's really important to emphasize here is it's very easy for us to get very worked up about the equipment because that's kind of the, the thing that elicits the kind of geeky excitement for everyone but you know the equipment is just one of the defense lines of development this is just one of the bits that makes up capability and having the personnel having the training having the infrastructure the logistics all of the much more kind of unsexy stuff um that that's completely vital for because if you lose that you can go buy another tank if you want but you're not going to know how to use it properly and you're just going to end up ultimately spending a bunch of money for, for no real reason yeah. So thank you. I mean, I have to say that I, a few months ago, I did a, I did a panel like this on the Marine Corps, US Marine Corps decision to delete tanks, which is with its, its horizon is 2030. And since then, my, my informal network, which is all the, which is, unfortunately is all people that can't be quoted, you know, they're talking about how much regret, <laughs> this sort of this regret inside the Marine Corps about the institutional memory thing. And, and, and you know they yeah, call it over specialization and how how quickly you can delete a specialty uh, and how long it takes to to get it back and um and of course and of course the united states marine corps is very lucky and it has a or peacetime rival but wartime ally called the united states army who generally are under the same command and actually have quite a few panzers although how 
the US Armour Corps is going to react to the right, and now you need to learn how to do all this stuff coming off a ship will be, um, I'm glad I'm not the one at Fort Knox having to explain that, but there you go. Yeah, yeah, I, I see a number of uh, marine marine tankies have, have moved over to the National Guard and, and so on, on the yeah. kind of en masse. Well, but yeah, as you say, you can specialise if you're part of, you know, the US Marine Corps is a good analogy for the size of the UK Armed Forces to, to some extent, but as you say, they've got the big brother there as well with the US Army, which clearly is a, you know, something we don't, well, we could enjoy that if we said we're going to be dependent on the UK, the US and other allies, but it's certainly not something we would necessarily want to do if you want to suffer. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah but I mean, I should also note that US Army soldiers are pushing back against the Marine Corps' assumption that they can rely on the Army for heavy armour. And the US Army is like, well, well, it's our budget and our, yeah. our requirements, and now we have to worry about yours too. Um, don't, you know, don't make these assumptions. So actually... Well, well and, actually, and actually pushing back further, if we said, okay, we're deleting the British armor capability because we'll provide other stuff for NATO, fine. So if we want to go and train with some tanks, what do we know? Phone, phone the Germans, say, can you send all your armor over to Salisbury Plain? Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, it, you know, as James rightly says, well, it's not the systems, it's the capability and the understanding, and you'll delete that as well. And you certainly won't get that back in any transition to war that's compressed to what seem to be modern standards, because they'll be busy worrying about interfacing with their own panzer grenadiers.